So you don't really have to do that deep of a demo in the first glance, in the first meeting ever, because it's all about sort of getting them to get a sense of that, yeah, they can do it. So let's talk about how to do it, because that's the next question, right? This is the Sales Bible Podcast, episode 358, Selling Value and Not Solutions, an interview with Sarah Larson. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non sellers. And now, your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, Sales Babblers. This is Pat Helmers. And today we meet Sarah Larson. Sarah is a technology sales professional from Stockholm, and she speaks with authority on how it's the value, not the solution that catches the buyer's eye. According to her, it's how you fit in their context that generates applause at a demonstration. In the space of B2B, and in her case, selling technology, we babble about the presentation and the importance of selling the value. And so, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Sarah. Are you ready to babble? I am so ready. (laughs) <laughs> I was just looking at your uh, your LinkedIn, and I see that you've been selling technology in the B2B space for quite some time. So I guess my first question is, like, why B2B? How did you know that that was going to be your sales professional calling? Yeah, that's such a good question. So I actually started in business to consumer as a normal sales rep selling gym membership cards, if you could believe it. And that was in my 20s. And then Uh, I actually went into sales because my sister, who is a sales manager at another gym membership firm, she told me that this is a great way to make money, right? So that's how it started. And I remember my first day, we were going to go to a school and on-site sell gym memberships to students. And I was terrified. Like, I was so scared. I I had to go away from the place where we were set up and just call my sister and say, this is not for me. I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm going home. And I was, yeah, I was, I was a wreck. And she just said, look, whatever they say to you, whatever approach you get when you approach them to sell something, it's not, they're not talking to you as a person. They're talking to you as a sales rep. And that means that they're really not talking to you. So whatever they say, it's not directed towards you. It's directed towards your, your role that you have on, like your suit that you're wearing right now. So if you don't go out there and kick ass, I'm going to be disappointed. And the worst thing in my mind, like the worst thing in my mind would be to disappoint her. So I went out there again and we sold like 68 memberships that day, just two of us, my first day of work. And then when I got home, I just sat down in my couch and I was just like, oh my God, I love this. I'm going to do this my entire life. Like it was just like an epiphany of how amazing it is to actually be able to reach people that way and sort out a problem for them. Because that's how I viewed what I was doing. So I started there and I got this extreme, like, I'm going to be doing this my entire life. That was like my first insight into how this is actually, how this can be as a profession. And then I worked there for six years and then I moved over to business to business because I thought that that was the next step. It was something I was drawn to because it was more complex. It has more to do with psychology when you have multiple decision makers, when you have a more complex solution. And I'm also really into tech. So I'm a gamer. I'm like a nerd. I love technology and I love video games and and playing computer games and things like that. And I also realized pretty early on that I love systems for sales. So CRM and all of those tools that you have available or had available at that point, I was really good at using them to get benefits from them which made me a really strong player when it came to understanding my numbers, which is specifically something that you would use a CRM for to sort of log and understand and make, make sort of make assessments based on if I do this amount of activity, this is going to be the outcome. That's just facts. Like that's just based on my numbers. This is what would happen. So when I realized that I wanted to go into that sort of business to business space, I sort of just jumped on it and I got a job and I started selling at that point it was web projects. And then I went over to ERP solutions, which is much more complex to bigger companies. And then I've been at an agency at head of sales and it's just been rolling on from there. But the starting point was really just understanding that this is all about people and psychology. And that is one of my main interests that's keeping me here. So that was a short sort of why that's my why I love it. (laughs) You said something 
I thought was very interesting. You said that your job was to sort out a problem. Mm. Yeah, that is the job, right? I'm not confused. <laughs> because I think a lot of people don't see it as sorting out a problem. It's almost like you're almost a concierge for the buyer. Yeah, I mean, my job is to help someone sort out an issue. And if I can't help them, my job is to be honest about it and move on. Like that is my entire like setup for who I am as a person. That's why it, it works really well. That that's the role that I have in the sales profession. Like that is what I'm there to do. And I think one of the things that you opened up about, I think most people don't see it that way. I agree with you. I think that's why we have a lot of people feeling like salespeople are a pain in the ass because they don't have that attitude towards what they're doing. Right. So I've worked with a lot of people who who also have a technology background, but they don't have a, a love or a passion about selling. Right. <laughs> um, in your experience, because you've sold because because you sold multiple things, how is selling tech different than other other products and services? Um, I would say that selling tech is different. And I mean, okay, I, w- I would back down and say it depends on on what scenario you are in when you're selling tech. So if you're selling tech and you have uh, other people around you who are going to support you with the technical skill, that's one scenario. So you have a sales engineer or someone who would support and actually help you do the demo and stuff. That's one scenario. The other scenario is when you're selling the tech and you need to be well in tune with the tech yourself. Like you're demoing yourself, you're, you're taking the hard questions, you're sort of uh, meeting the client needs of getting answers on your own. That's another scenario. So that scenario where you're actually both selling and knowing your technology uh, that's the scenario I've been in most of the time. And I think in that scenario, the difference is that you have multiple decision makers and you have a, a complete situation where you're always going back to the tech. Like that's what I see people who are not succeeding as well. You're always going back to the technology instead of looking at value. So if you know the technology well enough, you can actually on your own see the values and then it makes it easier to communicate them. But if you're just selling the value not knowing the tech. It's much harder to get the, the pr- proof of concept or the trust with the client. And if you compare it to selling only like consultancy services, I mean, consultancy services, if it's your own delivery, that's easy. Either you know your value and you can communicate it or you don't know your value because you don't have value and then you shouldn't be selling yourself. You shouldn't be a consultant. Like that's a simple thing because it's just you. But technology is selling that is about opening up the client's mindset to the opportunities and the benefits and the, the benefits long, along the line, like down the line, what is the benefits in the year with this technology? And I think that is the difference instead of selling yourself or selling something that's not tech based. Yeah. I, I noticed that. You, yeah, I liked how you said that, that, that too often people fall back on their technology expertise as opposed to focusing on the value. Yeah. Have you, um, have you ever done that yourself? Yeah, yeah, all uh, yeah, multiple times, of course. Like because when you're in a situation where you're not on your own clear of the value, and that that's been one of my issues. I've had one job where I sold the technology that even when I learned the technology, I didn't get it. Like what is this what is the value add? I couldn't see it. And when I couldn't see it, obviously I couldn't tell the client about it because I didn't have any faith in the value. That meaning me always going back to the demo mode and just like talking technology because I couldn't see the value. So I think most salespeople who who are unlike me, who can actually sell value without believing it themselves, for them, it's probably much easier to talk about value. For me, it doesn't like I can't do it. I cannot talk about value that I don't see on my own, meaning that I have to understand the platform in full and then I have to be able to sort of connect the dots to why is this valuable in the long run? Not just today, not just with the technology where you can push the buttons. What does it lead to? What does it mean for the ill organization that's buying it? So I think that's a really, that's a really, it's, it's, it's hard when you don't see value and that's when you fall back to technology and sort of going into demo mode. But when you see the value, like most of my meetings when I sell the technology I'm selling now and also going back a few workplaces, I do very little demos. I, 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 I like I, I can I can share my screen and show the platform, but I, I do like two clicks and that's it. Because I'm talking about the value that it can bring rather than how you push buttons. Because people like people can learn to push buttons. That's not the issue. And that you have a functionality. Yeah, we have a functionality list, here it is. 
Like we can do all of these things, but let's talk about what it what it's going to mean for you in your organization because that's the value. Yeah, I I can really agree with that because I remember lots of times when I was demoing um, software, I would ask people what they're looking for, and you would you would actually maybe chat for a half an hour before you were ever brought up the the software. Yeah, and then they and they would say, well, let's walk here through your list of things you want to see. And you'd kind of click, you click through a couple screens, and they go, "Oh, that's really cool." And then, then you go through the next one, they go, "Oh, that's really c- cool." And then on the next one, they go, "You don't have to show me; just tell me how it works." And yeah. next thing you know, for the next half an hour, you're just kind of walking through the list because you prove your credibility with the first few, and they yeah. believe everything else you say. Yeah, I know. That. I know. So you don't really have to do that deep of a demo in the first glance in the first meeting ever. Because it's all about sort of getting them to get a sense of that, yeah, they can do it. So let's talk about how to do it. Because that's the next question, right? How does this implement? What is the struggles when you're implementing? What is the challenges? Is it about a change project or is it about just getting people to do it? Is it training based? Like we, I often go into like talking about how really fast, like within the first meeting. Because one of the things, I, I sell a video software for salespeople. So one thing that I... That at the moment anyway. And I, the one thing that I that I can see is the biggest challenge is getting salespeople to want to do videos. Like it's scary. It has nothing to do with how they click a button into the system. It's about overcoming your own fears. Does that make sense? So we talk a lot about how you do that and what methods we're using to sort of get them over the threshold. And we talk very little about the system because it's just a system. They can learn how to push buttons. They will be fine with that. The issue is not there. It's over here, right? <laughs> well, it makes yeah. sense though, right? I hope it does. <laughs> yeah, this is not rocket science. No, but it's, it's the, pretty but it's simple. the idea of putting your face out there, right? Yeah, it's scary, man. Like most people think that's that's scary. And I mean, I think I do, I do, I, I can relate to that. I know that when LinkedIn released their video, uh, the ability to use video on your feed, when you could share with video, when they had that option, I went home sort of feeling sweaty and I just recorded like 40 videos in one take just to get used to it. So this is, it's scary, man. So we have to, we have to support that. And I think that has nothing to do with teaching a salesperson or any person how they click into a system. Like that is the easy part, man. It's the same with ERP or CRM. The easy part is teaching them functionality. That's going to be fine because we are, I mean, hopefully most companies are at a point where they're using digital software in some sort at the moment. So they can learn how to push buttons. But what's scary or what's hard is to get them to actually do it every day. I, 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 w- I want to go back to this conversation we had yeah. about the demo and okay. about the value. <laughs> Because you said that in your own personal experience that there was a, some software that you didn't fully understand the value yeah. that the buyer would experience. Yeah. Why is that? Why can't people grasp, wrap their heads around this? Um, you, you did it yourself, and I, I've seen this myself. What's that about? I, I think one of the things that, I mean, the specific situation, the challenge for me there was that I was selling to a decision maker who was in an, in a field of work that I had no interest in. So CFO, like financial director. And I am oh. so uninterested. So for him, the value that was for him, I wasn't curious enough because I didn't give it about his, his day-to-day life. And that was my issue. So since I didn't really, I couldn't up, I couldn't muster the curiosity to understand his situation and his challenges, that led me to being unable to understand, okay, I was like, yeah, you're putting data in here and you're getting data out. What the hell does it matter? That was the issue. So since I, and I could demo the system in full, I had no issues with learning the technology because it's just technology, but seeing the outcome, I could, I could understand on a logical level that this is going to give him, like, I can see that now when I, when I look back at it, when I've actually had some CFO friends, when I've actually talked to some pros in a different way than I had at that point, I can understand that having access to real-time data is going to give you a better foundation to make decisions forward. Like, I get it now, but at that point in my career, for me, it was just a financial system. It was boring as hell. So I couldn't sell it, obviously. Because you need to have some sort of interest in what you're doing. And since that experience for me, I've only always gone into companies that has a software that I really want to use. Like I have to have that feeling like this is awesome. 
I want this in my day to day. So let's sell this to other people. Like that has been my, my receipt of this is the right choice to go in here and sell this. I have to have that passion. I keep wanting to go back to your line. You're there to sort, <laughs> you're, you're there to sort out a problem. Yeah. Um, if you're not interested in sorting out that CFO's problem, you got no curiosity no. on what he's struggling or she's struggling with or what their aspirations are. You're, you're in big trouble. Yeah, I know. Obviously I was, I realized. <laughs> and I think one of the things that can be a bit frustrating when I look at salespeople, I mean, globally, that there seems to be so many salespeople who are working at the wrong companies. Like that, that is a big issue. They're not driving by passion. They're not looking at the solution before they take the job and say, oh my God, I want this. They're just saying, this is a job. And I think that's a mistake from a career perspective if you want to be in sales, because sales can be amazing and so much fun and so exciting. And you can solve so many problems if you love what you're doing. But if you hate what you're doing. Yeah, then you should stop doing it. <laughs> like, that's simple. That's simple. Like then I've, you get a new job. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, I've worked with people who aren't ethical. Mm. I've, you know, I've sold technologies and, and stuff that, um, that once I, the longer I worked there, the more I realized this isn't, this isn't real. Yeah. And then, and then I, I had to quit. Yeah. But that's, but that's because you have a long life. You have a long career. One job is not going to make or break you if you don't let it. And you have a long career. You want to be able to look yourself in the mirror. I actually, I have a good story about that because I was lucky enough when I was early on in my career to have a manager who taught me one of the one of the lessons that I've had with me my entire sales career. And this is a lesson that I think most people never even think about. So the lesson he sat me down to tell me was basically this. Like, okay, so let's say that you are... He had, a, he had an idea. This was before I worked with ERP. So this was before my, my catastrophe job in the towards the CFO. <laughs> but he had that as an example, actually. So he said, let's say that you're selling an enterprise ERP financial solution to a CFO of a big company. And then you get this feeling after the first or second session that we are not the right match. Like you have that sense that we are not the perfect match for them. And you also know, because you have experience with the industry, that there are better solutions that fits them better. That's going to get his job done better. That's going to solve his problems better or even at all than your solution. But then since you're a junior sales rep, uh, your manager obviously pushes you on. Like, yeah, of course you can, you're getting the sales, just do it. So you give in to your gut feeling and you make the sale knowing that this is wrong. This is the wrong path for the CFO. It's the wrong path for the company, but I, but I can make a sale. So I'm going to do it. You don't feel good about it though. You have that sense in your gut. Like this was not great. So instead of telling the CFO the reality, you do it. And then, and then my boss continued, my manager that told me the story. It was just like, so let's imagine a year later, the investment has turned bad because implementation went bad. The solution didn't solve the problem. It gave him a bunch of new problems. And you knew about this, like you knew about it. And you could have turned it around, but you didn't. So the CFO lost his trust with the management team because of this bad investment and bad implementation. Because the financial system, it operates across the entire board of the, of the organization. Like everyone's affected and it affects everything in the business. So that's a big, it's a big loss of trust for the management team. So his self-esteem goes down from it because that's what, that would be what happened if you make a big mistake like that in a job. So he makes a few new mistakes because he's have low self-esteem. So he's not being, he's not making decisions fast enough. He's like lowering down because he's feeling bad. So he gets fired. And my manager looks at me and said, so let's say that that's the end of the story, but it's not. So six months later, this guy, the CFO hasn't gotten a new job and he feels horrible, devastated and miserable. Obviously he's out of a job. He lost his old job because he made a few, a bunch of mistakes. One of them that you could have changed, by the way. He just added that and just looked at me. I was feeling a bit nervous at this point because of it, like, like I don't want to be that person who makes this happen. So because of him being that low in a point of his life where he's that low, his wife divorces him. And then my manager looks me dead in the eye and he says, do you really want to be responsible for that? And obviously my response was no, hell no. And after that, I completely changed how I looked at myself. 
it stopped being about being about getting a deal in. It started being about taking responsibility about the consequences of a yes or no, because you can control that. When a client has is in front of you and they have a solution that you're not the best match for, but you know that there's a better match, take your responsibility, point them in the right direction instead. It's better to lose that deal than have that situation come up because either, either way we look at the person there, the implementation would have gone bad. They would have churned anyway. It's not worth it. Thoughts? A, 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 I see a couple things there. <laughs> one, one is when you're... When you're faced with a set of requirements that your product doesn't really do well, this is an opportunity for you to write it down and get it to the product manager and say, you guys need to do this because we, we're we losing deals because our functionality doesn't do this. Yes. And that's the best way that they they can attune yeah. the, their, the, the technology roadmap. That's the best way they can tune and drive and, and, and have it go in the right direction because you're on the front line. You're hearing exactly what they're saying. So I think I was always kind of okay, if, especially when you're in a startup and your thing doesn't have all the bells and whistles. This is how you figure out what the bells and whistles are. Yeah, of course. People this is how you listen to the client. And it's super important for product development in any scenario, especially when you're starting out. Because then you really have a theory. You have really no proof that this is what the client wants. But I think in the individual thing, one of the things that I would like to communicate with this story is about the sales manager that's pushing on. Uh, like, so that's my second part. Well, that's my right? second part. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean to interrupt you, but. <laughs> no, go ahead. Shoot. <laughs> but, but, well, how stupid they got a quota plan and a commission plan that's based on just closing deals and not looking at the value of the customer over time. If they're going to be a difficult customer and they're going to be complaining, and especially in a world of social media, they're going to give you a bunch of one-star reviews. Is that really what you want? And I mean, in some cases as a sales manager, they don't even think about the things you just said. They don't think about that. They're just thinking about budget because structure is forcing people into that sort of buffer. Like that's where they're put. Okay, so this is my only option. And I think one of the things that I've learned from, from being in a sales manager role as well, is that you have to realize that the people who are in a team of salespeople, that's not going to be their only job. They have a long career ahead of them if they like what they're doing. So if you start in sales, you have a long career ahead of you. And this is just your first or second job or third job. There's going to be different other employers there that you're going to be with. That you And you would want to take the clients that you've sold to in work position two and move them over to work position three when you start a new job, if the solution suits them. So for me, sort of understanding that I have a responsibility to my portfolio of people that are buying from me so that I can keep them over time. Because I've always worked, basically besides the CFO and ERP solution, I've always sold to salespeople. So for me, every time I get a new job, I have a bunch of clients that I just bring in if the solution I'm now going to sell actually suits them. And I think one of the things with that is that understand that it's a relationship that can last if you don't give in to, oh my God, budget Christ, let's just pull down my, our pants and just give it to them. Like don't, don't have that short-term view of it because it's never going to benef be beneficial for you in the long term. So sometimes you just have to walk away from a deal because it's the best for the client. Just have the guts to do that. Yep. Even though your sales manager is on you, telling you that you have to close on budget, just ignore him or her and just say no anyway, because some clients should not be clients. You shouldn't sell to them just because they want to buy from you if it's the wrong situation. Like I don't believe that whole short-term at whatever cost. I, I don't believe it. And I've never really, I never really did. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Sarah, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to connect with you, how would they do that? Well, LinkedIn, probably. That's where I spend most of my online time. Or they can send me an email or text me or I, I'm betting that you're going to put up all my details on, on the, on the episode. Uh, but LinkedIn is a good start. And also when you connect on LinkedIn, please put a note like, I don't know why people still do that hold, like connecting with you without saying anything. Please put a note <laughs> in and, and talk to me. Like the whole point of LinkedIn for me is having communication. 
So don't be a stranger. Just don't come over with a credit, like with a business card, hand it over and then walk away in silence. Like that doesn't really work. It, online or IRL, like talk to me. That's, that's, a, that's a given thing I think everyone should be doing. So one thing that's interesting about you, Sarah, is that whenever we communicate on LinkedIn, you're always sending me a video, one of those can.me videos. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, what's that about? Yeah, so can.me is a video platform, the one I'm selling to clients and implementing. And basically the idea of why I use video in all my interactions, both in email or text message or through LinkedIn, is to give the part that's on the other side, the full scope of me, like all my, how I move, how my voice sounds and everything that you don't get with text. I think it's a better way of building a relationship, which is basically what we're using can for with our clients. So it's i uh, I'm a video nerd. It's exciting for me. I think it's fun. Do you like getting the videos? Yeah, they're fun. They're fun. Yeah. <laughs> I've used them. I've used some other systems periodically off and on yeah. to do videos. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but basically, it doesn't sound like you started using it structurally for sales. It sounds like it because otherwise you wouldn't stop. So do you think that you're not doing it every every day when you're doing sales for your consultancy? Is that is there any reasoning behind it? Or is it just because it's a, it's a habit that isn't there? I Yeah, it's a habit. It's not there. I felt like I used it. They were, they were kind of scripted. I knew what I wanted to say. Um I would probably do it differently now. I'd probably just try to think about really what I want to say. I mean, what I like about sending an email or writing an email it allows me to like edit it and think about it and really put some structure around it. Yeah. Um, it's kind I of like that's... a phone call. Even when I do a phone call, you know, I, I may, I may write some quick notes of like, you can say this, you can say this, you get to say this. So and you're I a think, prep, you're a prepped kind of guy. You want to be prepared and sort of well disponized into the the format that you're in. And I, I do I do get that. I'm just not that smart. I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't speak that well. I don't have this fluency that you have. Your this talent that you naturally exude. Uh, I, I I'm not as good as you, Sarah. <laughs> but you do you do know that you have a podcast, right? Like that's the only voice. Like you do know that, right? <laughs> Right. I mean, that's why I do podcasts. That's why I don't do YouTube channels. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. But obviously voice works for you. I think that I think think one of the reasons why you would approach it the way you have and many others do is because you don't find either you don't have the the need to sell and book many meetings. Like because you have a consultancy, you might just want to book a few meetings with clients and then you have a deal coming in. So when you have a bigger velocity, when you need to book ten meetings a week you need to have a structured way of reaching out. And I think combining first touch on LinkedIn with connection requests, then a video yes. email, then a call, yes. then a video email yes. number two, and then a call. Like Then you have the touch point just over a week where people will start responding to you because when they see that it's an individual, sort of our mind psychologically reacts the same way we would if someone was standing in front of us. And this is sort of a way of putting your best salespeople in front of your potential clients for 30 to 45 seconds, which makes a huge difference in response rate when you come back to looking at how many of them actually booked the meeting. And that's the interesting part when you combine LinkedIn, email, reach out, phone reach out and text reach out, then you get a, a really good combination of things that gets you to where you want to go. I like that. It's like this big, uh, this long drip campaign yeah, that's using exactly. multiple technologies. Yeah. You, you mentioned you mentioned here that you were willing to give away a free online session. What's that? Yeah. About? So yeah. So basically, I did this on LinkedIn basically a year ago. So I I just gave away fifteen minutes of a coaching session for whatever topic within sales, obviously that you want to perform better at as a performance check. And fifteen minutes, I got the reviews basically back to me. That was how could you nail me in fifteen minutes and give me advice? That's awesome. So that's that's my giveaway. It's 15 minutes over the phone or on an online meeting where you just have one question you want to focus on, where we sort out your next steps. Very simply, very fast, and very tight. Awesome. Yeah. So I hope people sign up for it. They can just email me or send me a text message or connect on LinkedIn and ask for it, and they will get I'll, a calendar link. I'll put how to connect with you all in the show notes. Yeah, um, that's great. Sarah, this has been fun. Yeah, the We've same. Had- <laughs> I really, really appreciate you babbling here on Sales Babble. It's awesome. It's been good. <laughs>
I really enjoyed that conversation with Sarah because it's all about taking a collaborative approach when you're presenting to a group of buyers. The goal is to have them get a strong sense that they're controlling the conversation, when in reality, it's the seller who has set the stage, enlarging their credibility to a level that where the buyers trust what the seller says without ever having to see it with their own eyes. When you reach that level of selling, that's true sales mastery. Sarah's got that. I've added links to her on LinkedIn, as well as can.me in the show notes at www.salesbabble.com. While you're on the website, you can find past episodes that talk about all kinds of things sales, lead generation, how to present, how to build a value proposition, how to overcome objections, how to give a demonstration, and how to close a deal. All of that information is free 100% on salesbabble.com. Why don't you take a moment and start perusing through there? I've had some really terrific guests who have some really terrific advice for you. Now, if you have any specific questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out. You can click the Babble Me button. If there's something you'd like me to talk about or maybe there's a guest that you would like to have me reach out to, give me some advice. I am open to doing everything I can to make this the best sales podcast on the Internet. With that said, that's all I've got for today, folks. So until next Tuesday, take care and have a highly successful and a profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble Podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com. This is a production of Abenero Media.